Hello everyone, my name is Nina Siddiqui and I am a CI, CIE certified uh, teacher to teach the syllabus um, of AS uh, and A2 um, level psychology and today uh, I'm going to be uh, doing uh, the AS level study uh, by Milgram. It is personally my favorite and it's very popular among the student community as well. And um, so it comes under the social approach. And um, the social approach basically looks at human behavior from the perspective of how the social forces influence our behavior or how the interaction, um, our interactions influence our behavior. So uh, one of the social forces that um, are investigated by psychologists is uh, social influence and um, and that is basically um, one sort of uh, one type of social influence that is investigated or that was in, uh, investigated by Milgram is obedience to authority figures so um, let's begin uh, this study uh, before uh, we uh, go on to the actual study I would like to pose a question to all of you that um, if I ask uh, you guys uh, that how evil are you, just take a moment and think about it, right? What would we, what would you possibly say about that? So yeah, um, mostly when I pose this question to my students, they are like, um, they're not evil, uh, you know, uh, what are you talking about? Uh, so um, I kind of push them uh, more and ask them that, would you hurt another person if you were told to do so by someone more powerful than you? And they'll say no. Um, and then, um, you know, I would possibly ask them that, would you say no to people who are encouraging you to act against your moral values? Then again, a big, you know, no comes along. And then, um, you know, I ask them that what would you have done if you were a German guard in Auschwitz in 1944. I don't know if I've gotten the name right, uh, but whatever it is, it's a place in Germany. And so if you were a guard um, in Germany um, under Hitler's time in 1944, um, what would you um, have done? So this brings us to the topic of the Holocaust and the Holocaust, um, you know, um, Hitler uh, was um, one of the most popular leaders and under him, um, you know, six million Jews were, um, were killed and uh, they were massacred. And um, so um, who is to blame? Um, the one and only Adolf Hitler. So uh, basically, you know, a social psychologist such as Stanley Milgram wanted some explanation for the horrors of the Second World War. And um, but six million Jews, as I tell, um, uh, mentioned, were, uh, uh, you know, slaughtered by the Nazis under the leadership of uh, Hitler, uh, who ruled Germany at the time. So um, this brings us to the question of, uh, you know, a very important idea that I always want my students to explore is that uh, be a good girl or a boy and do what you're told. Um, does this sound familiar to you guys? Aren't we all told to be obedient all our lives? Mindlessly obedient sometimes and sometimes be obedient to do horrific things like these. Well, so think about it, right? Whether obedience is a good idea or not. Um, because now I'm sharing with you something which happened recently in Pakistan where the Taliban's massacred 131 school children and uh, um, you know, um, this was army public school on which uh, the Taliban's attacked in uh, 2014. So this is a recent thing, you know, which happened. And then again, right, another horrific event, right, you know, which happened at the Abu Ghraib uh, um, 
prison where the American soldiers brutalized Iraqis, um, how far, um, you know, up goes the does the responsibility go? I, you know, uh, often ask the students, right, you know, what do you think? Who's responsible for all this uh, madness and this uh, inhuman uh, behavior? Um, so incidents like Holocaust and terrorist attacks in recent times show us that obedience is not always a virtue to be cherished. Um, after all, Germans and American abusers and the terrorists were just being obedient to the authority figures, right? So psychologists want to know that why do we do what we are told to do even when we don't want to do it? And were the Germans born evil? or they were just blindly obeying authority. This question perplexed Milgram. And he really wanted to look into it and understand that what's going on here, what's happening to humanity. Uh, so he uh, did this uh, um, outstanding and profoundly popular study uh, um, of obedience at Yale University. So the study um, by Milgram developed is probably the most proactive and controversial piece of research in modern psychology, and it continues to amaze students and challenges us all to consider our own behavior. So he wanted to design an experiment that would measure obedience and find out why Germans were particularly obedient. And in fact, he did not uh, follow through with this line of thought because he discovered that obedience to authority was not a feature of German culture, but seemingly a universal feature of human behavior. And uh, this is a very popular um, 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 video which you must watch. Uh, as uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the link of it um, um, in the uh, information below the video. And um, it's a by Curiosity Channel and How Evil Are You? So it's a replication of what Milgram did, and in recent times that are people still going to do after so many years? Um, uh, will this still uh, be so um, horrific, right? You know, and evil as such and um, and do uh, look into this video it's very interesting that what did the recent replication found out and uh, it's about fascism and uh, um, well fascism is basically um, a tendency towards or actual exercise of strong autocratic or dictatorial control so you know they said that okay uh, uh, Hitler was uh, basically a fascist and uh, so if you really want to find out that okay fine Hitler was a fascist right am I or, uh, or not right so there's an F scale which is there on this uh, website and I would like you know just for fun right you know do and see that how obedient you are and would you uh, you know uh, also kind of uh, come into the category of that or not. You never know. So just explore it and uh, whatever your result comes, um, you know, feel free to share with me in the comments below. Uh, so this is the website of it, right? Take a note, pause the video, and then you can uh, kind of take this test and uh, let me know what you discover about yourself. So yeah. So let's continue with the study. So one theory used to explain this, um, uh, the tragic events of the Holocaust is that German citizens possess some defective personal trait, um, you know, uh, with such extreme levels of obedience, uh, which made this extreme level of obedience possible. And uh, it was a dispositional argument. That means there's something wrong with the Germans um, genetically, right, or that German race, uh, which, uh, you know, kind of, uh, made them do all of this right and uh, but stanley milgram right who was himself born into a jewish family sought to challenge this hypothesis and he did not it did not settle well with him so he suggested a situational explanation for obedience and what is that that many people who are found uh, who found themselves in similar situations would harm or even kill other human beings under the author, uh, order of an authority figure and that's what he said that it's not 
um, the persons you know who are bad it's not the people who are intrinsically bad and uh, but it is in fact uh, you know the system the situation that um, has to be uh, that is the rotten apple and this reminds me of a study um, um, you know in tech talk by uh, by um, um, a very popular psychologist um, he uh, his study uh, his prison study was part of the as uh, syllabus also by Zim uh, so just check out the zimbardo study i will put the link below and see what he's got to say and he is very very clearly talking about that the same phenomena that is uh, is something wrong with humanity or is this right you know the system which is to blame for such things happening in the world even now so um so prior to the study, Milgram told psychology students and some of his own colleagues about the procedure he would use, um, um, you know, involving destructive obedience. And he asked them that how many participants um, do you think would uh, apply the maximum voltage of shock, right? So he wanted to say, um, you know, he created a scenario in his, in his study in which he wanted, uh, he gave a uh, uh, participants an opportunity to shock another participant and see that how uh, much you know possibly they would go about uh, doing so even when it's going to be deadly kind of you know so uh, so what he did was that he um, um, you know and those asked believed that uh, okay my face is coming in the way I'm just gonna move myself a little bit up so those asked believed that less than three percent Oops, sorry. Uh, less than three percent of the participants uh, would deliver the maximum voltage shock, and with many stating that uh, you know they felt that no one would ever deliver such a strong punishment. Um, so Milgram said that okay, let's find it out what happens. Um, so this brings us to the research method. I'm not going to cover the whole study possibly like in this video, but uh, just giving you a glimpse of as to how I go about teaching. And if you guys are interested, you can reach out to me and, um, you know, I can, I can do the whole study with you. I do one-on-one -on -one tutoring and, um, and um, exclusively need-based um, tutoring is my niche. Um, and I always uh, I'm so comfortable uh, catering to the special specific needs of the student community uh, all over the world. So, um, yeah, so let's come back to the study. So what was this research method? This research method, right, it was a laboratory setting, right? He, although it was a social phenomena, ideally it would be perfect to do it in a social setting, in a natural setting, um, in a real world setting. But uh, Milgram wanted to make it very, very scientific, and he did not want to. He didn't want to compromise on validity. So he said that, okay, I'm going to make a controlled observation in a laboratory setting, and uh, you know where uh, a lot of variables, right, which he could control, which he wanted to control uh, basically which would uh, influence the results and which would confound the results uh, possibly right you know could be controlled very uh, you know um, um, you can say um, very you know, nicely in this study so Milgram uh, originally described his study as a laboratory experiment and in this particular study each participant underwent the same procedure and there were uh, there was no control condition uh, however, he read, uh, later replicated, and there were a lot of replications of Milgram's study. And uh, you can look up, and some people say that there were more than 100 replications that he did throughout the world, and he found consistent results uh, in all populations. So in this study, participants' levels of obedience was measured through observation, and this was operationalized as a maximum voltage given in response to orders. So how was obedience, blind obedience to authority figures was measured? The DV was the maximum uh, voltage um, given by the participants, okay? Um, I am just assuming that you guys know what is DV and IV. Uh, at this point, I will, of course, right, have another video on research methods where I will cover all of the research uh, topics and concepts, uh, hopefully very soon. So yeah, um, so observers noted that participants, um, well, there were other things also, not only that they, uh, you know, collected qualitative data, 
uh, quantitative data as to um, the amount of voltage given by the participants, but also they uh, looked at the body language, the verbal commands, the protests made uh, throughout the procedure, right? Milgram wanted to just find out. And I'm gonna put um, uh, a link to that as well, you know, that how, uh, what were the words that were being, uh, you know, said by people. And uh, so, yeah. Let's look at the sample, right? Let's begin very conventionally, right? You know, uh, very uh, strategically. So let's look at the sample, right? How was the sample like? Um, I will uh, evaluate it a little bit over here because I will not be covering um, the whole study with you guys. But let's look at it, right? Uh, how did he start it off his study? Uh, it was a newspaper advert. He, you know, he, he did a uh, new, he put up a newspaper advertisement, and um, uh, where he uh, used, you know, he he recruited uh, 40 men between the ages of 20 and 50 years old, and this meant that it was a volunteer sample. Okay, uh, and it composed of all of the people who lived in the New Haven area of the United States. Uh, and the men came from a range of different backgrounds and occupations, and they represented the unskilled workers, uh, white collar workers, as well as professionals. So this basically shows that, you know, the, the sample had, uh, you know, a diverse, uh, you know, people coming from diverse backgrounds. And of course, right, you know, that makes the study more generalizable. And uh, you can say that it would have a population uh, validity. That means, you know, you can generalize it. But of course, right, again, they are all men. So how much can you generalize this to women and how can you generalize this to children and other populations, right? And of course, these are also people, people only from the United States. So of course, right, you know, you do put all of these questions into your mind that how I can generalize this to other areas. I'm going to cover um, uh, some ideas about how you're going to write down your evaluation also, um, uh, most probably in this uh, video. So uh, let's go to the procedure. Okay, so what happened in the study was that after responding to the newspaper advertisement, each participant was uh, promised uh, around $5 uh, for uh, taking part. And this was uh, not conditional on, uh, on their completing the study, but simply for being willing to participate that if you guys are gonna come, you're gonna give you this, right, okay? And the study took place at Yale University and all of these right things uh, were calculated by Milgram as to, you know, how I'm gonna go about and how it's gonna affect, right? Because this is now the authority place, remember, Yale University, a big name, and, you know, coming, going there and doing stuff right you know uh, where people are telling you to do uh, must be something right you know very important and therefore right you know this uh, mattered a lot a very very powerful strong variable which would affect uh, uh, you know the obedience level so yeah mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this was an important situational factor. So the participants arrived individually into the labor array and they were then introduced to another man uh, whom they believed to be another participant. And this man was in fact a stooge or a confederate. Uh, and he, had, he was uh, also chosen very specifically, you know, that he has to be likable and middle-aged man who worked for Milgram and um, had been trained in the procedure which followed. So why was the stooge uh, kind of likable, right? Just think of it, right? Take a moment and think about it. That why did Milgram choose a person who's likable and not very daunting, right? Had he been a very kind of an assertive and aggressive person uh, and not look very agreeable, right? How would that affect, right, you know, obedience? Or, um, you know, would, would the participants be more intimidated by this guy? And, uh, you know, how would that affect? So he wanted to control all of these things because these little, little things really matter um, and can affect the results. So both men were told um, that they would be allocated um, uh, the roles of a teacher or a learner. 
and in what was to be an experiment about the effects of punishment on learning. So now, you know, ethics comes in, they were deceived about the, um, the, uh, the real aim of the study because that had to be, uh, you know, hidden. If, uh, you know, you were told that, okay, guys, I am going to be measuring how obedient you are to authority figures and how far, you know, you're going to become evil. So, you know, people are going to say, no, we are, we are not evil, we are, you know, so that will obviously, they will not act out evil, uh, evilishly or whatever right <laughs> kind of so yeah um so that had to be um, hidden right so deception came, was something indispensable and it was something that you know um, justified considering you know um, the, the kind of behavior which has to be uh, observed um okay so um so what did Milgram do? He came up with a very ingenious idea that they're going to, uh, you know, draw pieces of paper from a hat that will determine their roles, and uh, but it was actually fixed. Okay, so uh, you know the real participant always were allocated the role of a teacher. Okay, so every time you're going to come in, you will have the teacher um, slip uh, coming to you. There was no learner slip. Okay. So um, next, the participant was um, taken to another room where the stooge and think about it that why did Milgram do that, right? What would happen, right? You know, how would that affect their behavior towards, uh, uh, towards um, the a learner? Okay, so because, you know, uh, they would think that, okay, you know, this is something which has happened by chance, you know, I would have been in place, his place also, you know, it's just a matter of luck kind of thing. And uh, next, the participants were told, um, were taken to another room and uh, where the student was strapped to a chair and had electrodes attached to him uh, by the experimenter. So um, the participants were presented with a shock generator, which consisted of rows of switches labeled with voltage uh, um, um, reading ranging from 15 volts to 450 volts. And the shock voltage was also labeled in the ascending order, uh, which uh, um, with words such as moderate shock to danger to severe shock to uh, the final two switches that was extreme, extreme, extreme danger. So uh, the participants uh, were told um, that uh, throughout the uh, uh, throughout um, uh, although the shocks were painful, they were not dangerous, and they were also uh, you know then given an example shock of uh, 45 volts as um, as a demonstration, and after this they were seated behind the wall so that they would hear um, you know but not see the stooge. Okay, so who uh, who were attached to the machine? So all of these things, right? You know, really uh, um, were very important to control, and they would influence uh, the results. Okay, so I hope everything is clear up till now uh, to you guys. Let's move on. So this is basically the shock generator, as you can see, um, and you know he made it so realistic for the participants and. Um, Although uh, the stooge uh, learners, uh, you know, um, although the stooge learner at no point in the procedure received any kind of shock, the elaborate machine was set up to convince the participants that they were really able to injure the learner, right? You know, they, 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 they kind of believed it because it was so realistic. And um, so the experimenter remained with the participant and the uh, same experimenter was used in each trial. And um, he was 21 year old teacher who wore a great technician coat and had a stern manner throughout. Now this was also another control that was a very important control uh, to be maintained because had this guy been intimidating and aggressive, um, you know, that would also affect the results, right? You know, people will be more obedient or less obedient, you know, if this guy was a timid guy, you know, who was like, so nobody would kind of care that, you know, why should I follow him, right? So he had to look a certain way. That was a very important variable. And the age also mattered. And the tone of voice also mattered, you know, that how he is going to go about. So all these little, little details, Milgram was aware of that he has to take them, you know, keep them in mind uh, when he is uh, 
uh, kind of looking at the behavior of the participants. The participants were instructed, um, um, you know, in a memory task, which involved reading pairs of words aloud to the learner and subsequently testing the learner on the recognition of words. So, you know, it was a memory task. That's what they were told. Um, okay, so I'm going to just put myself a little bit down again, I'm coming in the way. All right, guys. So, um, so whenever the learner, whenever the learner made a mistake, the participants were told by the experimenter to give him a shock by pressing a switch on the generator. So they were ordered to increase the level of shock each time by 15 volts for each error the learner made. And since the learners were um, was a stooge, they uh, they would follow a preset plan of deliberately giving the wrong answers um, at particular times. So everything was like kind of scripted. And until 300 volts were reached, the learner had remained silent uh, when receiving the punishment. And however, once the punishment level had reached 300 volts, the learners began to pound the wall in protest to uh, the participant. So the learner was told that, okay, guy, you know, uh, listen, if when you will be given this much, right, you know, you will start doing this. So all of this behavior was scripted and it was standardized throughout for all the participants, right? And this had to be controlled. It's a very important variable because the behavior of the learner, um, you know, would affect uh, the behavior of the teacher. So after this time, the learner had uh, no further noises um, and, um, and stopped responding to the memory uh, task altogether. So that is horrific, right? That is like, you know, what happened to this guy, right? Is he alive or dead kind of thing, right? So if, um, if and when the participants asked uh, the experimenter what they should do, and the experimenter insisted that they should continue with the reading of the words aloud and punish the learner, right? You know, and treating uh, no uh, responses also as, as an incorrect response so um you know he had no choice poor uh, guy you know the participant just imagine yourself being there so you know when participants uh, protested at this the experimenter continued to give him verbal prods in the sequence so remember guys right you know sometimes the question comes only to kind of highlight right how uh, were the verbal prods given and why were they given in a sequence and why were they standardized that for all participants you are going to say these sentences and they are going to be same and uh, you know with the same uh, voice the same pitch right the same tone so what was the phrases right you know you've got to memorize them he said please go on please continue okay the experiment requires you to continue it is absolutely essential that you continue and you have no other choice. You must go on. So these verbal prods or orders had a set wording and they were given in a standard order. So this is another control which uh, Milgram maintained. So, you know, there are so many controls, right? When I teach a study, I tell my students that, you know, keep a book with you guys and write, take a page and write down all of the controls because when you will be evaluating this study in terms of internal validity and you've got to give evidence, right? You will say that, okay, it's a highly uh, standardized and well-controlled study, right? You know, high in validity because so many confounding variables were controlled for, then what, right? How are you going to give evidence? One evidence is that, okay, you know, um, the, uh, the script of the, uh, uh, of the experimenter was uh, standardized and, you know, the prods were in a sequence. And um, for all the participants, there were similar instructions and given in the same order. So, you know, that is one control that you can highlight. Okay. So um, then uh, the procedure was also considered to be complete when the participants refused to give any more shocks or when they had given... Uh, uh, sorry, guys, uh, and the maximum volts of 450 available. So one-way mirrors were used to record the physical behaviors of the uh, participants and the uh, um, observers noted any comments that were made. And after the procedure was completed, each participant was interviewed and then, you know, the deception was explained to them fully. And uh, as part of the interview, the participants were asked to estimate how painful they thought uh, the final 450 was, was on a scale of zero to 14. Um, not at all painful or extremely painful, right? Now we wanted to find out that, okay, guys, you know, did you really think that, you know, this was painful? 
example, you guys gave 450 volts, right? What do you think? And, uh, you know, they, um, they kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, he wanted to find out whether they were uh, they thought that it was painful what they were doing or were they just doing it like that right you know and there was no thought um, in in what uh, whatever right you know they were doing but that was an important variable to find out also that you know what if uh, they they thought that oh well, it's just you know I didn't I didn't think that you know it was so painful or the person would die so that excuse would not come along right if uh, Milgram would surely say that these guys knew what the hell they were are doing over there so they were given a chance to meet the learner again in order to reassure them that they were not injured and to restore the participants well-being so this is another point that you can put in in ethics that okay Milgram made sure that these guys um, you know uh, uh, now what is this idea that we talk about in ethics is uh, is protection from psychological harm right so uh, the participants right you know have to leave the experiment in the same psychological condition um, as you know they entered that means uh, there should be no psychological distress or you know uh, harm given to the participants and that is an ethical requirement right an ethical code of conduct so Milgram made sure right you know this is uh, the point that you can give in when you're evaluating uh, the study in terms of ethics right and this is uh, this is evidence that you can give for that is that look Milgram did this right he made sure that these guys who were the um, you know uh, um, uh, the teachers uh, they were uh, you know they, they met the learner and the learner told them guys I'm all right you know nothing's happened to me I'm alive and functioning kind of thing so that's a good thing right okay so let's look at the results all right so what happened okay so most participants were convinced that all aspects of the situation were real and they were delivering the shocks, right? And the mean estimate of pain, um, you know, of 450 volts was 13.42 out of the maximum of 14. So, you know, these guys knew what they were doing. Okay, so despite the finding, right, being clear and the participants believe the situation was real, the participants, right, you know, uh, showed extremely high levels of destructive obedience. And uh, the mean voltage given by the participants was 368 voltage. All participants gave at least 300 volts. All participants. And that is something that you should really think about. 65% of, the, of them gave the maximum of 450 volts shock. And uh, Milgram is will be, you know, dancing in his grave right now. You know, when will, <laughs> sorry, not Milgram, Hitler. <laughs> okay, it's not funny. No, no, nobody's laughing. Okay, so um, it surely is a startling contrast with, uh, with the, you know, zero to 3% obedience rate estimated by Milgram, uh, Milgram students and colleagues right prior to the study. And, you know, here you can see that 75% of the participants, right, you know, um, uh, sorry, uh, what, what was 65%, sorry, sorry. 65% uh, of the participants, right, went all the way. Um, and that is, uh, that is like something very shocking. So, however, the qualitative data was collected in the study and that revealed that participants showed, no, uh, showed signs of tension and, uh, you know, when undertaking the procedure. So they were kind of affected. It's not that, you know, they were not affected. And that was, uh, you know, the Milgram saw in terms of the qualitative data that well, how were they really acting, you know, when they were, they have, were told to do all of this. So observers reported signs of nervousness in participants and each, uh, you know, which increased as they gave more and more electric shocks. The participants were also frequently observed uh, to be sweating shaking and goning and also with 14 out of 50 men showing signs of nervous laughter or smiling so these were all of the qualitative data that you can highlight the milgram study right you know when you're evaluating it in terms of that uh, you know it is a study which is very holistic and it, it collected a lot of data um, you know, qualitative as well as quantitative. So you can highlight that qualitative data in terms of, you know, how the participants behaved uh, was also observed, right? So um, 
And this is evidence of the qualitative data uh, recorded by Milgram. Okay, so one participant right, could not complete the experiment because he went into a violent seizure and presumably as a result of high level of stress, right, he was experiencing. So this was kind of, you know, this is something that you can put up in ethics. There's a study, right, you know, involved a lot of uh, psychological harm to the participants, right, and that's not something, right, you know, nice. So uh, the participant during the study, uh, you know, uh, like some of the comments also you can mention, right, you know, that the participants were genuinely stressed out, right, and when you are giving evidence of that, right, you can mention all of these phases, uh, which are part of the, uh, you know, of, of the original study. So comments made by the participants who protested at the orders given included, I don't think I can go on with this. I don't think this is humane. I'm going to chicken out. I can't uh, do that to a man. I'll hurt his heart. Uh, nonetheless, the verbal prods given by the experimenter were generally successful in persuading the participants to continue. And after the procedure ended, the participant showed visible signs of relief. And, you know, they wiped their faces and they were, you know, signed and they shook their heads like, you know, what the hell was going on here? You know, and a small minority of participants, however, did not show elevated levels of stress and appeared calm during the procedure. Mm -hmm. So who were these guys? Conclusions. So what are the conclusions? Right, Milgram study supports the idea of situational explanation of obedience. And he identified a number of factors which contributed to high levels of obedience recorded in the study. So one of those factors is the perceived legitimacy of the study. Okay, so first of all, right, you know, the study uh, is, uh, is uh, happening at a very powerful, you know, very strong authoritative place, right? The professional academic environment of the study, uh, you know, the uniform of the experiment, uh, all of these were very important factors which encouraged obedience, right? And uh, so uh, that was one factor, right? Milgram went on to draw two main conclusions from his study. Firstly, right, you know, if the question comes that what were the two main conclusions, right, you're going to highlight these. So individuals, right, are, uh, are much more obedient to authority than he might reason, uh, than we might reasonably expect. And this seems to be true for majority of the people. Okay, number one, despite high levels of obedience, people find the experience of carrying out a destructive act under orders of the authority figure, it triggers feelings of stress. Okay, and um, this is due to the conflict between two important social phenomena, that is need to obey those in authority and need to avoid harming people. So you're going to highlight that how did Milgram make sense out of the whole behavior? He went deeper into it and he explained it, that what was happening guys is that there was, a, there was an important conflict going on here. So let's go to the evaluation, right? You know, what are the strengths? As I talked about, right, you know, earlier as well, uh, when you evaluate a study, you've got to give, uh, you know, take the P approach to it and you're going to make a point and then you're going to give evidence and then you're going to, uh, you know, give an explanation of it, right? And uh, that is the so what part. So let's take one example, the first strength, okay? First strength of this study was that it was a controlled observation. So what? Always ask yourself, so what? Because the examiner would be asking, so what, right? Don't assume anything uh, that, you know, the examiner is going to assume that you know or the examiner knows, right? You've got to highlight what you guys know and make it very, very clear with no question marks over there in the examiner's head because there'll be no assumptions made by the examiner that you guys know it, okay? So make it very clear. All right, so... Uh, First of all, point. So what's the point? In the study, you was a controlled observation. So that's a point, right? You're trying to make, you are highlighting a strength of the study. It was controlled observation. Yay, very good. So what? So you're going to say this means that it was possible to control a lot of extraneous variables in this experiment, right? Such as the age was controlled, the personality, the appearance, uh, you know, um, uh, of, the, of the actor, right, playing the stooge. So all of these things were controlled. And these were important variables to control because they, these are going to influence, uh, you know, uh, um, the obedience levels. So uh, if... Uh, uh, let's say, um, so this means that the level of shock administered by each participant um, was not based on whether the participant felt more or less sympathetic towards different stooges. Um, 
for example, you know, uh, they might have been left willing to deliver shocks to an older individual. So remember that the stooge, uh, you know, uh, who was playing the stooge, his age, his personality, his appearance really mattered, right? Had he been an old guy, had he been a young guy, had he been an aggressive guy, this would have influenced, right, you know, people's, like, you are going to really back off, right? You know, I'm not going to electrocute this guy. He's going to, uh, you know, like... Uh, um, uh, bang my head up or whatever, right? Kind of you get that get intimidated. And if it would be an elderly person, you will, you know, kind of have some empathy and kind of some respect. And these variables were controlled because the guy uh, was the same personality and, uh, you know, the same age and the same appearance, right? So that's an important control. You're going to highlight the evidence that this is what one control I'm mentioning here. And so what? So you're going to say that, uh, you know, this was important because, uh, you know, very important behavior uh, variable, uh, that means the behavior of the, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the teachers or the stu or, uh, you know, uh, the participants would be affected by the personality of the stooge. So also the procedure was standardized throughout, right? That is, we're going to, uh, you can take another point that it was a very highly standardized environment. And uh, so what, right? You know, what is the evidence of the standardized environment? The verbal prods, right? We had mentioned before as well. So the verbal prods were the uh, same each time, right? Also, they were in a sequence and the level of control and standardization of the procedure means that the research was more reliable, right? You can evaluate the study in terms of reliability. What does the reliability means, right? I'm assuming that you guys know what is reliability, but I'm just gonna like kind of before ending this, uh, um, this um, uh, study uh, or this video, right? I'm not gonna finish the whole study possibly in this video. Uh, but uh, I'll just like to mention that, okay, uh, you know, you guys must know that what is validity? Validity is whether the experiment is measuring what it claims to measure. So if Milgram says that I am measuring ob blind obedience to authority, guys, so did he measure that? Okay. Um, and if he did, then it is a valid research, right? It's a valid uh, study. And reliability means that, you know, whether you're going to get consistent results that each time, right, the study is done, are you going to get the same results, right? So a thing is uh, said to be reliable or a study is said to be reliable if it's going to give similar results each time it will be done. Uh, again and again, okay? So it has reliability because, you know, there was a lot of controls. There was a lot of standardization. So if Milgram did it, right, you know, I'm gonna lay, take the whole study and I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna make sure that, okay, all of these things are controlled for, and, uh, you know, most likely I will get similar results. So, you know, it's, it's very easy for, uh, you know, other later researchers to replicate the study. And that is a good thing. And that's always a good thing for the, um, um, you know, the research, which is uh, a laboratory research, okay? Each participant went through exactly the same experience and um, and also, you know, there was little little details uh, which ensured internal validity. That means it was it was made very realistic because you know often this uh, this uh, uh, study is kind of. Um, um, uh, critiqued on the idea that you know it was it was an artificial environment therefore it has no ecological validity but then you know that how much he made sure that things looked realistic to people the electric shock generator you know it looked like so real that yes this machine does work it did not look like a plastic machine or something right you know um, kind of uh, um, but it looked like a genuine machine which would possibly give currents and then there were also, you know, um, uh, electrodes, um, you know, attached to uh, the learners. Okay, and uh, so all of these things, right, improved uh, the validity of the research. Okay, so I am just gonna not go through the weaknesses, right, you know, I am putting it up, you guys can look at it up uh, yourself, that what were the weaknesses, pause the video, and see uh, what the weaknesses of the study was. And if you have any questions, you can always come um, you know, and ask me. So surely Hitler wouldn't be happier he, um, after what Bilgram did. 
And this is a, a very um, um, recent uh, replication of obedience which happened in the real environment. And this was done by the BBC and obedience test. And I'm gonna put up the link of this also in the comments below, check it out and see, because you know when you're going to design your own study, um, you know, paper two is about designing your own study, then this will be helpful the more and more ideas you have as to how I can design it in a realistic, in a more natural environment, because this was an artificial Visual environment that he did. So, if I were to do it in a in a real, um, you know, a real life scenario, how am I going to go about doing it? So, these are very cool ideas. I just love them, and there are a lot of ideas, right? And feel free to reach out and ask me that as to how you can replicate the study in the, um, in the real life setting. So, do check out these videos. Um, it's uh, it's an excellent uh, so um, you know social. Um, research which was done by the BBC. So that's all for now guys, right? I'm going to meet you all again in the next video very soon, which I'm going to upload and take care of yourself and goodbye.